You'd be forgiven for thinking that the topic of women in Shakespearean theater would be an open and shut case. Women were not allowed to perform on stage until well into the 17th century, after the restoration of the monarchy, and following 11 years of Puritan-led civil war, a full generation after Shakespeare died. And it shouldn't surprise us that fewer than 16% of the nearly 1,000 total characters in all of Shakespeare's plays, only around 150 characters, are women. They speak fewer lines and have fewer grand speeches, too. Women were second class, not as important, objects to be acted upon rather than subjects doing the acting. But why then do we have relatively little trouble thinking of powerful and impressive and memorable female characters? Sure, there's Hamlet, Othello, Macbeth, Romeo, Shylock, Henry V, Falstaff. But then there's Catherine, Juliet, Lady Macbeth, Ophelia, Titania, Portia, Imogen, Cleopatra, Tamora, Cordelia, and Goneril and Regan. While Shakespeare wrote many, many, many utterly throwaway male roles, every single female role, no matter how small, is unforgettable. What makes Shakespeare's women so impressive? Is it the fact that a man was able to write such perceptive insights into various aspects of womanhood? Some people point to the women in Shakespeare's plays as proof that Shakespeare could not have been written by the man from Stratford at all, but that Shakespeare had to be a woman. But whether you're a Stratfordian or anti-Stratfordian, it's undeniable that the plays attributed to him are full of maids and matrons, wives and mothers, daughters, lovers, magicians, bods. He wrote women with such a depth of feeling and passion. These are fully developed characters with wants and desires and needs and, most importantly in many cases, the ability to pursue them. To that end, Shakespeare almost feels like a feminist. Is that why his women are so impressive? They're passionate, like Juliet or Catherine, and demure, like Ophelia or Desdemona. They're strong-willed, like Portia, ambitious, like Lady Macbeth, and defiant, like Miranda. They're clever, full of vitality, ready for challenges, and, for the most part, unafraid to speak their minds. In a world that valued women only in relation to the men to which they belonged, Shakespeare's women brighten up the stage and leap from the page. Feminist icons lauded even today. Tina Packer, in her in-depth survey of women in Shakespeare's plays, Women of Will, chronicles the changing attitude of the bard towards women, from his early outings with Julia in Two Gentlemen of Verona and Joan of Arc in Henry IV Part I, to his later work with characters like Miranda in The Tempest or Hermione in The Winter's Tale. Charting the growth of Shakespeare himself as a writer in this way is fraught with difficulty, as with any situation in which you read into an author's life from their work but there is little doubt that the women of Shakespeare changed over the course of his working life. The women of 1593 are very much not the women of 1613. But society was changing too. It would be foolish to say that Shakespeare shaped the society in which he lived to any meaningful degree on this front, but is the reverse wholly true? Were society's changing mores the only reason that Shakespeare's women grew and changed and developed in such fascinating ways over the two decades of his career? Or was he reading into and harnessing the feminine power of his women characters because they spoke to him in a singularly powerful way? In this episode, Aidan and I have modest aims, to look at the changing attitude toward women characters in Shakespeare's plays, from the two gentlemen of Verona through The Tempest. How do these women act? How do they react? What imbues Shakespeare's women with the power that so few writers even today are willing to give them? Since brevity is the soul of wit. More of your conversation would infect my brain. Romeo. Wherefore art thou, Romeo? To speak of him as my kinsman, he's a most notable coward. An infinite and endless liar. An hourly promise breaker. The owner of no one good quality worthy your lordship's entertainment. I'd beat thee, but I should infect my hand. The lady doth protest too much, methinks. The course of true love never did run smooth. With that, hello, Aiden. Hello, Lindsay. We're, uh, yeah, going to be discussing the, the women characters of Shakespeare today. And yes. uh, it's it's a topic I'm looking forward to. I think it's one that you've been looking y- forward to a bit. Very much, yep. Yeah. It was one of our top ones when we came up with uh, a list of ideas of what we'd want to discuss. Uh, and it's a juicy one. Yeah, there's there's a lot to talk about. So um, let, let, let's give the listeners a quick overview of how we're going to kind of structure the episode. Mm. Um, we, we're going to 
kind of follow Tina Packer's uh, example, as in her book, she follows a chronological order mm-hmm. through uh, Shakespeare's uh, life and works, trying to match up um, and so, to some ex- ex- extent the uh, changes in Shakespeare's life to the changes in the women characters that are expressed. We're just going to be looking mostly at the characters themselves. Yeah, and we're, kind not, of... we're not tying back so much to that. Um, yeah. But we are going to generally follow a bit of a structure that way. Uh, we're going to talk about um, pairs of characters from different ages in the books or in the plays i should say uh so some of those earlier women uh the maids uh some of like the middle women as wives and mothers and then uh the other category yeah well and and we'll talk about you know comparing some of the queens that shakespeare has written though we're not going to be getting into the the english history plays so much just because those kind of act as a separate category almost they're they're propaganda plays they're meant to portray not so much reality as the reality that Elizabeth or or King James, James wanted wanted to be portrayed on stage. <laughs> exactly. Um, but but yeah, we are we are going to try and pair up some of these characters to show how you know the they they were different. Even early plays, mm-hmm. you know, you could have different different perceptions and different um, written characteristics for for the yeah. same type of female character and. And that's important also to to remember is that even though we're we're talking and and I think Aiden and I both sort of agree that that Shakespeare's women are interesting and incredible even if they're not the most. Um, How are you going to characterize it? I want to hear this. Well, I I, I <laughs> and we'll get to this I think at the end of the episode, but um, I wouldn't say that they are the most well rounded characters that have ever been put to pen to paper sure. to write about okay but but even still um it's it is interesting to see how there is a bit of a breadth when we talk about them yeah even though they fit into a few yeah, these general kind of, categories, yeah, categories you know and, like and the, we've yeah we're guilty of that we're putting them in these categories it's for ease for ease of talking about it on yeah. a podcast people do it when they write books about them i yeah. mean it's 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 easy maybe it's lazy but it does serve a purpose i think to kind of structure uh to structure our talk today um so yeah and some of the things we'll be touching on as that i think these are just worth mentioning off the top because we'll probably be returning to them multiple times but um there will obviously be other avenues that we'll be exploring on each of these characters too but um women as they fit into the elizabethan and jacobean uh, power structures uh that existed in the time that Shakespeare right, was and writing, women's roles in that society, right? Yeah. How that how they changed and how they remained static in some instances, and well, and just how the characters themselves respond to those existences. You know, if a woman can only be, uh, you know, property of her father and then her husband, um, how how does that create um, the woman herself? Almost, and, you know, and does it arguably? Yeah, are there women? <laughs> like, do they yeah. exist as 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 anything other than property and if they don't fit into the general box of womanhood if they can't be mothers or if they never get married how does that um play into things which is interesting when you talk about characters like lady Macbeth, for for instance right so um Um, and the other one i think just quickly mentioning it is the whole idea of cross-dressing and how it how it impacts uh the reading of a lot of Mm -hmm. the characters um and whether it's a subversive thing if it was undercutting uh, gender roles of the time or whether it was just reinforcing them by saying oh look at those silly women they can dress up and play but they all ultimately all usually wind or up getting that, married at the end <laughs> or is it that the only way that a woman can can do any acting is if they're dressed yeah, as a man yeah, right if exactly. that's the only way that they can have power or yeah. anything so yeah those are those are good um uh things i'm sure we'll be coming back to quite often quite as often. we go through nothing will come of nothing I guess the first thing we'll 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 go back to the very beginning. We'll talk about some of the early um the the early characters, early female characters which were I mean there are a lot he's written queens and maids and wives and mothers throughout the course of his career, but mm-hmm. we focused uh, in doing our research for this, we focused a little bit more on the maid character, the maiden character or um the the young lover. Yeah. And um and we figured it would be fun to kind of compare and contrast Catherine, 
and Katarina from uh, The Taming of the Shrew, and Portia from The Merchant of Venice, with Juliet from Romeo and Juliet and Ophelia from Hamlet. So this is roughly fitting into the middle 1500s to the early 1600s. Yeah. Or sorry, early 1590s yeah. to early 1600s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just to correct that. So um, these are our women who are kind of caught up in the machinations of the men around them. Yeah. And how do they either buck the trend and, and assert control over this? Or how do they give fall, in, give in or... and kind of fall under the under the control even more? And what happens to them in the end? Yeah. And I, I think uh, Catherine's a great one to start with. Because, I mean, Taming of the Shrews, uh, I mean, the play's about her. She's in the title. Uh, and she's she's a shrew. I mean, she's she's What is a shrew? What is a shrew? A shrew Wait. is, uh, 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 <laughs> I guess you would say, an opinionated lady, <laughs> uh, young maid. Uh, so it's someone who's unmar- unmarriageable, yeah. uh, basically, is how she's set up in the in the play. I, I wonder why why shrew, though. Shrew yeah. is, is kind of a, a, I don't know, a rodent-type figure. Yeah. Uh, 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 animal yeah it's are they odd... are they mean i don't know i've never met be. a shrew i've never <laughs> i don't know but they get you know you call women shrews today yeah. if they're if they're they speak opinionated yeah, if, exactly. they're, if they yeah. don't fall in with the chaste silent and obedient uh trope that that shakespeare Which and is others... not necessarily the the uh, paragon that of today the way it was in shakespeare's time but no. yeah in shakespeare's time that was the the height of femininity it was chaste silent obedient uh and Catherine was none of these things, no. especially silent. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the play goes to great lengths to, um, you know, show how strong she is in the sense that she eventually gets broken down mm-hmm. and she does consent to marry um, Petruchio. No, yeah. not Petruchio. Yeah. Is it Petruchio? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, and it's kind of a, I mean, reading it now, it's it's very brutal. I mean, he basically he denies her food and doesn't let her sleep. Gaslights and, her. Yeah, he gaslights all her the whole play. Like, doesn't li- let her have clothing. Yeah, like it's it's awful. It's terrible. But stuff. he does it. It's it's like it, you know when you break a horse, you you broke. Yeah. he broke her spirit. Exactly. And and so I mean, we don't want to get too much into the reading. We haven't discussed this play. It's it's next up on our on our um, chronology of. Of yeah. topics but so we'll get into that a lot more but but it is interesting that she is um she's a title character as Aiden said but also um she's shown to be this strong person in order to show how dramatic it is when she's broken down yeah and I guess the interesting reading comes into that modern day readings I don't know if if yeah uh, how it was uh, contemporary past, yeah. readings were the same but but is her transformation calculated? Is yeah. she doing this on purpose in order to assert control sort of over Petruchio or over Bianca, her sister? Yeah. Or is she actually broken? Yeah. So, and, but, and a lot of it in, in the text, it's not really clear. You can kind of read it either way. And so, we've seen performances of this where yeah. it, it does kind of go either way, yeah. where it's, where it's. There's somewhere it's like, she's just, yep. Yeah, oh yeah. I'm, I'm doing your, I'm, chase, I'm silent yeah, and obedient exactly. now. And there's the others wife. where it's, where it's almost like she it's and me. Petruchio are kind of in on it together. Yeah. And they're doing this to, to make a point about something. Marriage yeah. or something. Yeah. It's not super clear. Uh, but yeah. So, I mean. Contrast that with uh, and that portrayal of, of, you know, kind of giving in, but, you know, perhaps retaining a, a sense of, of self um, to Juliet, who, right. uh, you know, in some ways is the exact opposite in, mm-hmm. the, in the sense that her the whole play is her seeking out what she wants, which is a relationship with Romeo in the right. end. Um, and, you know, the, the structure she's working against are family. Uh, and the the structure that her father would have to give her away, and he's never going to give away to a is Romeo and Montague. I can never. <laughs> oh my goodness! I can never remember. Yes, Romeo's a Montague. <laughs> Juliet is Capulet. Her father. Her father. Uh, it's so fascinating, and I love doing this play because um, it's it's. The, the, she's 13 years old. She's yeah. not the height of sophistication. Unlike Katerina, who is much, much older, maybe not much, much older, but but certainly an old maid by the time she gets yeah, married to Patricio. Like 20 maybe. Jeez. Yeah. Horrible. <laughs> um, but she engages in all this subterfuge in order to marry Romeo with the help of Friar Lawrence and, and without her father's permission because her father wants her to marry Paris, who is That's right. the this you know beautiful young man who... You know, and even after she's married Romeo, um, her father consents to give her away to Paris like two days later, and she has to fake her death in order to get out of it. Like there's yeah. there's really no option for her 
she can't commit bigamy and marry somebody else. She yeah. can't. Although I don't know if that's necessarily. Uh, it, it might be a concern. It's not explicitly stated. I think it's more just I can't betray Romeo's yeah, love yeah, and trust yeah. in Mary Paris as well. Yeah. But um, to get out of this marriage, she literally has to die. Like that's the only way that she can get out from under under her father's thumb. Yeah. And uh, and her mother falls victim to this too. Like her mother is so weak willed. Yeah. And can't won't won't stand up to her stand husband. up to yeah, her husband yeah. at all. Yeah. So um, it's really it, you know it shows that women were daughters. Mm-hmm. And they were property property of their parents, their property of their fathers, until they could be married off, and then they became property of their husbands. And Juliet tries to buck that a little bit, and she winds up dead. Wa- she winds up dead, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And and it's it's possible that she ends up dead because Friar Lawrence and Romeo botched their their plan. Romeo isn't even aware of the plan. Yeah. <laughs> but but the men that are controlling these situations don't do right by Juliet. It's yeah. really a, a horrible tragedy for this 13-year-old girl who goes through hell in the span of I think it's like 72 hours or yeah. something yeah, like that, right? Yeah, right? From beginning to end. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's you know, she's not strong-willed like Catherine is, but yeah. she's she's still doing her darndest to to assert some control over her life and it ends up very very badly for well, her and, and that's kind of the the parallel is there that they both get punished basically by the patriarchal society yeah. of you know Catherine is tortured into submission juliet's killed yeah. by the male figures in her life eventually well, by herself by herself but, <laughs> but pressured into it yeah. through this right um so i mean in that sense the plays do have a similarity. The difference is in how the characters themselves, Juliet's very young and she yeah. is, you know, it doesn't seem like from the start that this is going to go well. You well, know, you know like it's not because her name's families. in the title, but that's also interesting <laughs> because when you talk about Taming of the Shrew, like yeah. the title character, yeah. that that's a But kind Taming of, a joke. of her, exactly, yes, exactly, right? Like, and that's the thing. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it, part of that's the comedy uh, tragedy lens that we're being Binary. Applied. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it was going to be a different outcome for both, but um you know, the, the, the similarity is there. But is it that much of a different outcome, well, exactly, really? Because yeah. if, if you're if you're alive, but your spirit has been completely broken, mm-hmm. is that much of a life? Wouldn't yeah. you rather be dead? Like, yeah. I don't know. I, I guess that, that kind of is left open to interpretation. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, the whims of the director. But yeah. Um, so, interesting yeah so moving on to yeah um, portia and ophelia are another kind of interesting pair in that again they have a similar thing in that they're they're both they both to an extent give into uh what their what their fathers especially uh tell them to do so mm-hmm. portia uh is ref- is not allowed to marry unless her suitor picks the right chest of the three uh the lead gold and silver i think they are i don't mm. know it's again it's been a while since i've read these ones um but uh you know, she she is forced to uh, marry whoever her father chooses based on this ridiculous three box solution. Yeah, uh, and you know, you get the the suitors that come and go. I honestly can't even remember her eventual husband's name. Is it Bassanio that she winds up marrying? No, yeah, it is Bassanio. Okay, uh, so so uh, she uh, Portia kind of is interesting in that she's uh, once uh, she gets Bassanio, uh, it's who she wants. Um, but she's basically followed through on the, the patriarchal drive up to that point. Like her father has set out these caskets. Exactly. She, she exactly. can't like like give any hints to the people. Yeah. And there's these ridiculous princes and suitors who yeah, come in come and in pick in gold and silver thinking that that. But, you know, we all know that, of course, the the, the picture of Portia that is going to be in, in the leaden casket. Um, and I think what's interesting is that what what makes it successful is that she knows Bassanio and she trusts that he's going to yeah, understand this. Exactly. Whereas, you know, with Romeo and Juliet, there is no they they barely know each other. Yeah. And with Caterina and Petruchio, it's another situation where there's no love there at the beginning. It's it's Petruchio is doing this as a, a favor to his buddy. He wants to marry her sister, and her sister can't get married yeah. until she gets married. So yeah. there's no there's no you know existing relationship whereas Portia and Bassanio seem to have a, an understanding yeah. almost yeah um so that that is what I mean, she can go along with the plan because she trusts that her her love knows her well enough and yeah. is going to be able to come to, through to the right conclusion right, right? yeah and contrast that with Ophelia who um similarly uh follows her father's directions in terms of kind of 
I, I hesitate to say leading uh, Hamlet on, but she kind of leads him on and she, he use, she uses her feminine wiles to extract information from mm-hmm. him and stuff at the behest of Polonius. Um, and uh, there she's she winds up being punished for it um, because partly because she doesn't have that that relationship with Hamlet that she thinks she does. Right. Um, so Hamlet's also playing her at the same time, which is one of the... You know, she, he's going to appear mad to her and, you know, drive uh, right. his his father or his uncle, father, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, to question him a little bit and stuff. So there, there's a little bit more at play there. It's not a straightforward love relationship because Mm-mm. of the context of the play. Um, but I think it's so in this case, Ophelia is getting punished and she winds up, you know, going mad. And right. As opposed herself. to Portia, who is rewarded. But but you're right. And, and it's because they they don't. They're not honest with each other. Yeah. I think the honesty and the trust that comes from Portia and Bassanio's relationship is what ends up rewarding them. And possibly the in certain interpretations, the trust between Katerina and, and Petruchio, Petruchio could be, is yeah. what leads them to have the happy ending happy. that they can sometimes have depending on the production of the play. Yeah. Um, but with Ophelia, I guess one thing that I – it's tragic but I like it is that she does take control of the end and does – end her own life Hmm. and i don't know if that's because it's it's the one form of control that that a woman could have they couldn't make more money to buy themselves out of these awkward situations they couldn't you know for for a lot of women who weren't willing to dress up like men as portia does in order to get bassanio off the or in order to get Antonio off of yeah. the the charge of from Shylock, from Shylock and that whole in the courtroom scene, which yeah. is one of my favorites, yeah, and I, it's one of the reasons why I love Portia. But um, Ophelia's not willing to dress up like a man. She's not going to dress. And Juliet's yeah. not going to dress up like a man. Like these things don't occur to these women because yeah. they are so entrenched in in the idea of femininity. And this is what it means to be a woman, a dutiful, duty yeah. bound woman doesn't do these things. Whereas exactly. the women who buck that are the ones who can salvage, achieve. Uh, salvage yes. this kind of happiness. Yeah. And that's, so, so yeah. within that construct, you're very limited. So yeah. both Juliet and Ophelia have to take their own lives in yeah. order to get out of the situations that they're in or in order to fix the unhappiness that they're in. Yeah. And that is tragic, but it also, I think there's a certain kind of strength in that. And, and, I hesitate every time somebody says that, you know, Juliet is stupid. Yeah. You know, no, she's not. Yeah. She's, she's, she's young. young and in love. Exactly. And, yeah, and, she, and it's, yeah. it's, it's actually remarkably astute for Shakespeare to have chosen teenagers for yeah. this to happen to because we all know that their brains just aren't fully functioning yet and yep. they don't come online until 25 or something, <laughs> right? So, um, so that's, that's that's doubly tragic and ophelia is not much older right yeah. so th- these are these are young women who who are they're not stupid they're yeah. they're doing they're doing the best they can yeah. and the best they can happens to be the end of their lives because that's what the society dictated was yeah. allowable yeah and they really don't have another option out of it i mean part of that's uh, it's like the opposite of plot armor. It's kind of like yeah. the plot is leading them towards this tragic downfall because it is a tragedy. Um, whereas, you know, the Merchant of Venice, I mean, Merchant of Venice is kind of a tragedy if the merchant you're talking yes. about is Shylock, right? So, I mean, there's there's the, that whole aspect. But I agree. I think the the cross-dressing aspect here is important for Portia because um, it's it's the avenue that allows her to have agency once again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's interesting because her character doesn't, necessarily seem like it's building up to that i mean her early on in the play she is you can tell she's vivacious and she has mm-hmm. intelligence and she's she's well spoken she's not she's not going to be trampled underfoot exactly she's not you know, you know ophelia's demure and, and everything and and uh that's you know again polonius exploits that uh whereas portia you can kind of always see this coming but then uh when she does do the cross-dressing and she and that courtroom scene is is i think one of the biggest uh, indicators of how Shakespeare viewed women because she's the best word person mm-hmm. <laughs> in that play a yeah. play all about you know the, the contracts legal, and yeah exactly legal legalities exactly yeah. um she is the best lawyer of them all yeah um, and she's a woman and, she's a and woman. She, she women didn't read back yeah, exactly. then like that yeah. that's what's so fascinating yeah, right exactly and I think that is is a great counterpoint to Ophelia in that she winds up having the most and she is actually the hero of the play mm-hmm. in the sense of saving everybody 
Um, and she also has all these great tricks that she pulls on Bassanio at the end when she reveals the, the gender yeah, reveal yeah. and everything, right? So, uh, I mean, yeah, Portia's really uh, an amazing character for that. And it's very early on in the plays. I mean, this is one of, it's still in the 1595-ish, I think, range yeah. we were thinking. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's fairly early in his career, um, but he's created a woman who's, uh, you know, headstrong, but willing to play by the rules. Yeah. Um, but undercut them when it's necessary. Yeah. And, and it's that, and, you know, she's a, she's a great example of finding that balance between having the agency to um, be her own person and achieve the goals that she wants, like having her husband's friend not die. Right. Uh, and also, you know, playing by her father's rules well enough that it goes through. And again, this is, again, it's because it was kind of a comedy structure. Mm-hmm. It lends itself to that a little more. It yeah. doesn't have the overtones of that, but it could have easily been called Antonio, the merchant of Venice who dies because right. Shylock gets his pound of flesh, right. right? Like he could have structured it however he wanted. But you could, you could, Still, and we we again we've seen productions where Shylock is the victim at the end, and this yeah. is this is a tragedy because Portia becomes the antagonist yes. who takes Shylock's or or contributes to the taking away of Shylock's um, his agency and his religion, everything that that means anything to him. His daughter his is daughter, gone, everything. his money is gone, his livelihood is gone, his religion, like everything is gone, yep. and and Portia is. <laughs> is Antonio's savior and the one who sends Shylock to his grave. Yeah. You know, like this yeah. is this is a tragedy That's if you read it that point. way. Yep. <laughs> so so she's she's almost villainous in that in mm-hmm. that reading, if you read it that way, which it's hard not to today. Yeah, it, like yeah. a modern reading of, of yeah. Taming of the I mean, or, sorry. Of Merchant of Venice. Yeah. Venice. Yeah. I mean it's I mean, Shylock's just such a, he's kind of a good villain though, at the same time, because he's yeah. just he's so insistent. Like he will not accept anything. Because he wants vengeance so badly, which that, we'll we'll get to when yeah. we talk about the Merchant yeah. of Venice a little bit more. But but it's I do like that that Portia is not easy to box in. She's yes. not very much like um, the opposite of the other characters we've mentioned so yeah. far in this in this <laughs> yeah. opening bit. Yeah. Portia's kind of she's set a, apart. She's a maid, but she's also a pretty good wife before they're even married to Bassanio, yeah. you know, like, like, yeah, she's and I, all these things. I should also say like the trust that, that Bassanio and Portia have for one another is kind of undercut entirely by, <laughs> by the fact that Bassanio gives the ring away. And, <laughs> yeah. Like he's yeah. this, and, and again, it's, it, it's very much like two gentlemen of Verona where, you know, the men are just these bumbling idiots who yeah. have no, and the women are the ones who, yeah. who kind figure of it out figure it out it and all, save yeah. the day yeah. sort of. But in, in Taming of the Shrew, sorry, in the Merchant of Venice, um, there's a there's a, a much more positive um role for the women yeah and, yeah and and they have the kind of the the forward momentum of their own volition yeah that they're the ones yeah. who carry out these these actions and arguably it's because Portia's wearing pants it's not because yeah, yeah you know exactly. she wouldn't be able to do that if she were wearing a dress you well, exactly know? And, that, and that's why i love the the cross-dressing elements i think there's a lot of ways of interpreting them but mm-hmm. i i really find them as uh shakespeare undercutting whether you know because if women aren't capable of thinking then there's no way they could possibly cross-dress as a man become a lawyer and out lawyer all the lawyers right but they do so i mean i think yeah. i feel like it's it's quite a um a disruptive kind of yeah understanding of of what women were capable of um you could review it as like oh well it's just more enforcing the patriarchy that of course yeah know, dress like a cr- man then yeah. you act like a man yeah exactly and then it's possible but, but yeah but yeah. but you're right that that the women it's almost it it's essentialist in a way it's mm-hmm. saying that that there isn't this big difference between men and women. The difference is really superficial and it's yeah. based on the, the clothing. The clothing, I but guess. But at yeah. your core, there's an essential intelligence to humans and women possess that too. Yeah. So it is rather radical, I guess, in a sense, especially when you see – and there's so many cross-dressing characters in Shakespeare. So, yeah. I mean, we'll talk about this a lot, I'm sure, as we go through the rest of our character list here. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some other maids, maiden characters yeah. throughout Shakespeare's yeah, career that are worth mentioning. We've we've listed out a few. There's um, Cressida from Charlie's and Cressida, Beatrice from Much Ado About Nothing, um, Viola from Twelfth Night, mm-hmm. the other comedy women generally. Yeah, yeah, I I kinda, we kind of clumped them all together. Cause... And Rosalind, yeah, as yeah. you like it. Yeah, um, exactly. These are all characters who, again, either um, like fit into that patriarchal norm they're demure and they're 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 feminine they're Mm -hmm. 
ultra feminine or they have like Viola, for instance, you know, cross-dressing tendencies that lead to their salvation almost yeah. at the end, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I know you really like Cressida as a character, Aiden, if you want to talk about... Well, Cressida, uh, yeah, I mean, she's she's interesting in that she's um, a maid who's kind of... She, it's the ultimate patriarchy, you know, you know, hammer that comes down on her yeah. because, I mean, she's basically... She's the reason she's the phrase uh, as true as Troilus and as false as Cressida is around is because she was basically sl- sold as a as a like almost a prostitute to uh, the Greeks. And that's what upsets Troilus enough to think yeah. that she's untrue is because yeah. she was sold like she's not she has no agency whatsoever. Um, and then he's mad at her when she's sleeping with another guy because that guy's offering her protection in a world where she has no protection. Like yeah. it is literally one of the worst treatment of women. Yeah, it's a fundamental whole... under- misunderstanding of of what Cressida, the, the, the trouble that Cressida is in exactly. on the part of Troilus. Yeah. Because, and, and I think it's interesting also because Cressida is, um, she's powerful in a way that other women aren't because she talks back to the men while yes. dressed as a woman, which is yeah. like Catherine, Katerina yeah, yeah, in Taming yeah. of the Shrew. Um, but also there's some... Like she's she's so she's innocent until she marries Troilus, yeah. and then as soon as she's had sex, she's yeah, this she's kind of fallen worthless. woman. Yeah. Everybody starts yeah. making fun of her, including her own father. Yeah, and then she's sent off to the Greeks. Yeah, and she banter's with them in a way that yeah, yeah. doesn't happen. Yeah, and it's part of that that banter. I mean, some people have read that as as like she's got sexual agency yeah, and it's almost like bit. her sexuality is what saves her life. Yeah. Because she has value finally. Is. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. But it's also what Troilus can't, like that's what devalues her yeah. in her husband's because eyes. he can't have that sexuality. Right. But yeah, it's, it's like very... Like it's, it's tricky. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I always feel terrible for Cressa. She's really yeah. got the shittiest deal and uh, yeah. So um, the other one I really love though is Beatrice mm. from uh, Much Do About Nothing because yeah. she's... She she is the one woman who is consistent in being neither silent, silent chaste, nor mm-hmm. obedient. Uh, she's not punished for it though. But she's not punished for it, which is awesome. It, which is the really interesting thing yeah. because um, and I can't remember Benedict. her love Benedict. Thank you. Uh, yeah, her love interest's name I couldn't remember, <laughs> but uh, he's uh, he loves her for that. Yeah, and I think that's almost the more feminist character is the fact that. There's a man out there. I, I think he's a knight or uh, a yeah. man of the realm or something, and he uh, he falls for her. He's just yeah. like, you know what? She's great. Twice because yeah. they were together <laughs> before right. the play starts, yeah. and then they're not, yeah. and that's why they have this witty back and forth yeah. because they know each other intimately, yeah. but they're not together anymore. So they can they 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 can have fun. I can imagine this as being like. Um, uh, uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. Yeah. Or yeah. Um, I just... Well, it was Kenneth Branagh and... Uh, what's her name? Um, oh, wow. Emma Thompson. Emma Thompson. Yeah, in, in the, the, 90s the film version. version. Yeah. yeah, which was amazing. Yeah, no, it, it's perfect. <laughs> it's like you have this shared history and you can you can elevate your... Your friendship is, is deeper than just would-be lovers because you yeah. are... Former have lovers. been yeah. lovers <laughs> yeah, you exactly. know so yeah. it's it's great and then and she does she sticks up for her friends she's yeah. um she's very is that with hero is that much ado i think so yeah 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 like she's just she's just she's she incredible her, yeah, I love she's Beatrice. her own character yeah she's seems more or less fully fleshed out and she still finds a way to make it work in yeah. the world um and part of that's because she has Benedict to uh, support her and he winds yeah. up marrying her at the end. Um, but the fact that there is a male character that's willing to see the value in that, yeah. I think would have been pretty subversive as well. Which and, and because a lot of people think uh, scholars, people who are fans of Shakespeare, look at Much Ado About Nothing and Taming of the Shrew as kind of the same story told yeah. twice, yeah. But, but with very different way. outcomes and very different ways. Like Benedict and Beatrice are very much like Petruchio and Katerina, but, um, but it's more positive, but it's more it's positive less, and it's, it's a little bit later on. So it's maybe a little bit more mature, but I love the fact that even in this early period, you have, um, you have all these varying depictions of young women as being either, very much oppressed and stuck within their 
their role and their mm-hmm. place in society and that great chain of being, or they are able to assert themselves and they're able to assert themselves in a few different ways, which is really cool too. It's not just, it, you know, it's not like Shakespeare only allows women to assert themselves when they're dressed as men or only yeah. allows them to assert yep. themselves by killing themselves. Yeah. Right. Like that's <laughs> not, it's, and, and I think that's where you kind of break the mold a little bit of, women as stock characters yeah. they they react and interact with the other characters appropriately yes. and individually yeah. depending on what the plot needs and it is important to remember that shakespeare isn't exactly creating these these stories no. whole cloth like no. he's he's always adapting yeah I mean, so it's yeah. not it's not strictly shakespeare that can take credit for that but True. It's but he, he's popular. also known for making adjustments and changing yeah, things as he, exactly. as he wants. So, so. yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, Viola is a great example again of the cross dressing. I don't think we need to go too much more into that. Um, uh, Rosalind, Rosalind is a character from uh, As You Like It, mm-hmm. which apparently I've seen twice, but I I can't remember the play unfortunately, which is not a great sign. Uh, but that's just you and your terrible memory, <laughs> exactly, like, especially with real. character names. Is that a Rosalind? Oh yeah, okay, sure. Romeo and Juliet. Was <laughs> that are, about? Which one are they? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but apparently, yeah, she. I was reading about her character, and again, she's another kind of interesting example of um, a maid who uh, is kind of forced into tough situations, but kind of comes out um, mm-hmm. okay in mm-hmm. the end of of the the scheme of um, the patriarchal society that she's around. It is a tale told by an idiot. It's full of sound and fury, signifying. nothing um so i think we can move on to kind of the uh, middling period or early yeah. middle part of of shakespeare's career with um some of the characters we, we've just decided that we're going to compare two characters who are both wives and or mothers well in this case not wives mothers. wives specifically and yeah. not mothers yeah. but but we can talk about mothers a little bit in this because um we're going to look at desdemona from um othello, othello and lady macbeth from Macbeth. Macbeth, obviously. And these are two women who are very, very interesting characters. Yeah. They're, like I said, these middling characters who are both, um, well, Desdemona, I mean, obviously, she's, I, I don't know if she's the first, but she's one of the early instances of a woman who's falsely accused of adultery and can't defend herself, doesn't even get the chance really to defend herself before no. her husband kills her. Yeah. And, um, and she's, Othello is her husband. And, She's very much acted upon by not only Othello, but by Iago. And the whole play is structured around, or it seems to to lead right towards this um, this final confrontation between, between husband and wife. Yeah. And there's just a profound lack of trust. In, and there's there are a lot of reasons why Othello is important and why Othello is, is a different kind of play. Because Othello himself is... Um, not particularly powerful in in the same sense yeah, that other male sense, characters yeah. are because he's black because yeah. he's he's a, a an oppressed figure or represents an oppressed class of yeah. of character so um his psychological space is very much coming yeah. to bear on on his wife and the people around him yeah. and it's taken advantage of by iago who yeah. is the a prime villain yeah. so um so as a wife, though, Desdemona is absolutely pure and true, and Othello just can't, because of those psychological burdens that he's bearing, he can't trust her. He mm-hmm. he can't accept that she didn't um, betray him. Yeah. So the flip side of that is with Lady Macbeth, yeah, who is who just, is one of the more, more most powerful women, I think, yeah. and she's fantastic. I love <laughs> Lady Macbeth too because she's just. I mean, you could argue that the whole play hinges on women. And it, like, yeah. Macbeth really does. Like the witches kind of set everything yep. off. There's these self-fulfilling prophecies and you've got Lady Macbeth goading her husband. Into fulfilling them. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like <laughs> yeah. take more power and do this and yeah. do that. And and her breakdown at the end is also fascinating because, again, we get this psychological portrait of someone who is so guilty and so wrapped with guilt. And on top of that, there's this this very interesting sense of her character being defined 
by what she is as well as by what she isn't. And and the motherhood mm-hmm. aspect comes into play there too, that that if it's implied that if she had been a mother, she would be a softer person, but because she's not, yeah. like I, I forget the quote. It's fantastic though. It's like, you know, stop up my uterus, you yeah. know, like just gird me against all of the the softness that necessarily woman, flows yeah. from my womanhood yeah. and make me a man almost, right? Yeah. And and turn me into this the person that my husband needs and it's important to remember too that Macbeth was written um or performed shortly after yeah Elizabeth the, yeah, died yeah, was, Elizabeth famously yeah. uh not a mother I don't think Lady Macbeth as an as a non-mother character, character yeah. would be allowed on the yeah, stage if Elizabeth right. was on the throne yeah. but it seems almost like maybe a commentary on on motherhood yeah and how essential motherhood is to soft femininity. Yes. Well, definitely of the archetype of the time, right? Like you you needed, I mean, women were property to produce more property in the yeah. form of children, right? Yeah. And if they weren't either capable or willing to do that, then what value did they have? And here we have two different answers almost because Desdemona as well is not a mother. No, she's um, not. That's they've, right. They've not been together very long. So, you know, potentially she could have been one eventually. Uh, but uh, Lady Macbeth is not a mother, will not be a mother. So what value does she have? Well, she's basically running the country, essentially. Um, she's she's the one, she's the voice in the ear of the king driving him to yeah. make the decisions. She creates he her own value, yeah, which is exactly. really awesome. Yeah. And and I feel like that, um, that marks her off as really different. Yes. Because she's, she's, she's creating a role for herself where there wouldn't necessarily be one. Well, and you're right. Uh, she does make her own value, um, whereas Desdemona kind of doesn't, and that and that's also an interesting mm-hmm. contrast between the two. Um, Desdemona's happy to play mm-hmm. the male game. She's a wife. She is true. She is silent, chaste, and obedient. Basically, yeah. I mean, yeah. probably not chaste anymore because she's with she's married to Othello. But uh, but chaste you know, within that relationship, exactly, it's, exactly. It's, yeah, it's yeah, allowable. Yeah. So I mean, she's really they're they're two opposite ends of fulfilling the Shakespearean era um, idea of the, the ideal woman. So, um, but they're both, um, well, again, they both wind up dead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, Lady Macbeth, interestingly, uh, is, does she commit suicide? She well, does, it's, it's, it's not really clear. It's not clear. Like it? she goes mad and then she's dead. Like it's, yeah. it's whether she, I think it's implied that she does, end her own life yeah which which could be seen as an indictment of women trying to be, reach yeah, overreach, overreach with their ambition <laughs> exactly right uh whereas desdemona also dies because she doesn't do any she's not ambitious yeah. at all she doesn't even defend herself uh really strongly when she's she's basically saying well i know i'm true so yeah she believes gonna hurt so me. so strongly in her yeah. own innocence that and she trusts othello enough yeah. that uh he's never gonna hurt her yeah. um and so i mean in both cases, women wind up dead because <laughs> either they they push take too action hard or don't or don't. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, yeah. and that's that's kind of an interesting take on wives, especially because mm-hmm. um, you know previously we talked about the maids and they were still independent women to an extent. Like I mean, they all usually a lot of those maids had father figures who were important. Well, and, and or they the get stage. married at the end of the play, so exactly. they become wives, but we don't see them as wives. Exactly. But but the the women who are wives first and foremost in the play. Um, I, I think it's interesting in that, uh, especially for Lady Macbeth, that they could be viewed as that powerful over their husbands. Right. That, that just a few whispers, a few suggestions could mm-hmm. have him murder a king and, you know, do and, you know, set the kingdom, the kingdom into chaos and stuff. Uh, and Desdemona, it's like uh, it's, again, almost the opposite. It's like, well, she's she can be so she can mean so little to someone like Othello mm-hmm. um, whose social situation, as you said, is so precarious mm-hmm. um, that they can, he'll just throw away her life with, with no thought whatsoever, yeah. basically like he doesn't really investigate that. Well right. Into, no, not at all. Anything, he right? just so, takes Iago's yeah, word, word as, for it. as gospel Yeah, um, over his wives, his wife's word, which yeah. is, uh, comes back to what we talked about in, in the two gentlemen of Rona, that, that male friendship was the paramount, yeah um relationship that yeah. that could be trusted and and the relationship between a husband and wife was valued less yeah. so we have two examples of that where um if Othello had trusted Desdemona we wouldn't have had Othello would be called 
something else entirely, it wouldn't be a tragedy. And if we had, uh, and, and, and on the flip side, we have Lady Macbeth almost becoming a man in order to become her husband's best friend. Um, and that leads to the ultimate tragedy. So it really does seem like both of those are less about the relationship that men have to women and more an indictment of the relationships that men can have with other men and how, um, how women either fall victim to it or victim to the men when they indulge in that relationship or because of that relationship. Like they, they, they become that relationship and then they fall victim. But it's interesting that both of those characters are, are women Bef- wives before mothers they haven't become mothers yeah. or they will not become mothers there are other wives who are mothers yeah. that are that represent interesting things like we have tamora in titus andronicus who yeah. is um yeah which again i've never read but uh i read the description yesterday yes. she sounds like a badass like, oh yeah she's, like she's she's, she's a, a captured badass. woman whose children are all murdered and she eats the like she it's it's she's so fierce and 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 angry i think that's the thing she is so spiteful and driven by that spite to commit more atrocity um and she just doesn't care and i'm not sure how much like that's not a typical representation of femininity but it is interesting that it is a woman who is titus andronicus's main enemy in that way like yeah Yeah. right like she is she's the one that that features most prominently that he's up against right um, she's the captured queen that he's, she's the reason she's going to be married to so-and-so and then, or she ends up marrying the person who was going to marry Titus's daughter. And there's all sorts of problems that arise because of these things, but she is primarily just a very angry woman. We don't yeah. see her. She's, she's fiercely defensive of her children. Yeah. And that's why the, the, the punishment that she gets for that is that she eats a pie in which her sons have been baked yeah. into which they've been baked. Yeah. So she she's very like it's I don't I don't quite know how she fits in but it's it's well, it's fierce seems, motherhood. Exactly. She seems like an exaggerated version of Lady Macbeth almost yeah. in the sense that she is basically becoming a male role but she retains that motherhood aspect mm-hmm. um which is really interesting and and I think it's an interesting play because it is again an earlier one actually. Um, but this this strong woman character, literally strong, like in the fact mm-hmm. that she wields power and and uh, you know is the antagonist, I think is really interesting. I think when we get to Titus Andronicus, mm-hmm. it'll be worth talking about her character a lot. Um, some other really good ones. Uh, I think Gertrude alone is is a, such yeah. an interesting character because she's Gertrude from uh, Hamlet. that's Hamlet's mother. Yeah, Hamlet's yeah. mother. Um, because she is both. Uh, a wife, an ex-wife, and a mother in mm-hmm. the play, uh, and in Hamlet, she's uh, two of those things, and it's in, it's that dichotomy that drives Hamlet to hate her. Yeah, I think a little bit. Um, and uh, Tina Packer's book, uh, when discussing Gertrude, I thought it was really interesting in the sense that uh, all the the versions of Hamlet that she's directed and acted in, um, in most of them, Gertrude is happier. Mm-hmm. Now that she's with uh, Claudius mm-hmm. um, and not Hamlet Sr. Because uh, she was never kind of happy in her previous marriage, perhaps. And uh, she willingly chose to remarry. Um, and that's what causes... I mean, and Hamlet says so. Like, you you, you jumped into another guy's bed right away. Yeah. Um, you know, she could have put it off. You know, she could have been in mourning for five years or whatever, right? Like, Well, there was an acceptable period of time that was considered okay. And the fact that she didn't abide by that yeah. makes her exactly. suspect. All suspect. of her motives are suspect. Exactly. It's, at least, especially for Hamlet, yeah. right? But, um, but it, it's almost like, well, why did she do that? Probably because she wanted to. I mean... Claudius doesn't really there's no real indication that their relationship is that bad yeah you know and it's um hers and Claudius yeah yeah yes, Gertrude's right. and Claudius right so uh it's she's an interesting character in that sense is that she's for you know as a queen she's probably and everyone agreed when she was when people discuss her basically mm-hmm. the way Hamlet talked about her before um, she was fulfilling the the, the role, the role the dutiful of role. the dutiful role. She was probably silent, chaste, and obedient as queen for um, many years as mm-hmm. as Hamlet's wife, um, and so she's probably she's following a similar role under Claudius, 
But it's just, it's the fact that she chose Claudius is enough to make Hamlet hate her. Yeah. And that's really interesting that it's, it's that small, it's her seeking her own pleasure. Yeah. That causes him to be upset. Because it's never once implied that she had any part in Hamlet's father's no, death. No, not at all. He's not mad at her, even though he, he knows Claudius killed his father, he doesn't think his mother was involved. He doesn't hate her because of any involvement with that. Yeah. It's purely because she didn't mourn yeah. his death. The way the Hamlet way. wanted her to. Yeah. And yeah. that that is it's sad. And it's something that I think a lot of a lot of people experience. Um, you know, you have an aging parent who who is widowed and they marry again and you feel suspicious of their even if it's been twenty years since they <laughs> lost their spouse. I mean, it's 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 not an uncommon yeah, reaction thing. to have, for sure. But Hamlet takes it to an extreme, and, and it's not fair to Gertrude. She doesn't do anything wrong. Yeah. And yet she still ends up dying at the end yeah. because, well, everybody dies <laughs> everybody in Macbeth. Dies, yeah. Or in Hamlet. Yeah. In Macbeth, too. Yeah. But in, in <laughs> Hamlet, um, everybody dies. So Gertrude ends up dying because of the the silly uh, preoccupation that Hamlet has with... with um, defending his father's honor which maybe at the start and we can talk about this when we get to hamlet because yeah. i'm sure we'll have things to say about it but is it is it in hamlet's head entirely does he actually need to seek revenge does his father's ghost actually come down to him yeah. is this actually part of the the story yeah. or is this all in hamlet's head and, and it's really sad that again you have this powerful woman who is queen of denmark uh twice over <laughs> to two different yeah. kings and she is still kind of under the thumb of her son yeah in such a strange way and all because she has needs and desires yeah. for someone that he doesn't like and yeah. doesn't approve of yeah and all, she's condemned for that yeah um yeah it's a brutal it's a kind of a, a rough again she gets a rough break for break yeah. of it here because um yeah she's really not i mean the rest of the kingdom is kind of okay with it to an extent i mean well, we don't get any indication get that they're riding much. in the streets yeah, about exactly. it right they don't yeah. really mind it's just hamlet and his kind of adolescent yeah. fury at her um which kind of sets everything which off is, and it's it's interesting because she does have those those dual mother uh wife roles and i think um you know those when those get into conflict mm -hmm. we don't get too much of that in shakespeare's no. place i think Car she might be one of the only examples of someone who's whose desire to be a good mother. I mean, and, and she, you see that too. Yeah, I mean, and, and even Hamlet, Hamlet, and Hamlet even admits that. Like, he yeah. still loves her as a mother. He just thinks she failed a, as a wife. Yeah. And that is, that is <laughs> there's a split it, because she can't be both. She can't yeah. be a, a good mother and a bad wife. Because she's a bad wife, all of a sudden she's a bad woman, period. Yeah. And even though he admits that she is she's a good mother, yeah. and, and that there's still love there, he yeah. can't accept her. And he doesn't he doesn't stop her from poisoning herself, right? No, is that's that how true. she dies? I don't remember how she. Dies. Yeah, she drinks the poison. <laughs> she drinks poison. He could have just smacked it out of her hand and said, sure. "No, don't." Or, uh, well, no, he didn't know. It was no, it was, it was true. Claudius. It was Claudius. Yeah, but but that's yeah. that's another instance. Yeah. Like you know, Claudius himself does nothing to yeah. you know her Same value thing. to him is really only only extends so far as the throne, and after mm -hmm. that he has no, um, you know. Yeah, what's their relationship? I, it's yeah. hard to tell, yeah. right? And then that's and that's one of the great things about Hamlet is that a lot of this stuff is kind of open to interpretation and left yeah. unsaid, so you can read into it and play it different ways on stage. I think Hermione in The Winter's Tale is another one that's similar to Gertrude, and that she um, she's accused of adultery and um, is is banished. And dies, oh. but comes back to life, which makes her kind of an interesting character huh. in and of okay. herself. But in the process, like her husband is so upset at her because she convinces it's so silly like he sees her having success where he failed in convincing someone to do something and he assumes oh she's sleeping with him and then banishes her <laughs> that's such a typical guy and thing. and she gives birth to a, a baby girl that he also banishes but then in the process of all of this um his children his son dies mm -hmm. and he and then his wife dies and then his daughter has gone and then he's you know he's He's distraught and he's distraught for 16 years until his daughter Perdita comes back and things return to normal and Hermione comes back to life. So there's um, in this case, it's 
and I forget Hermione's husband's name, the the yeah. but he Leontes? Yeah. Maybe. Leontes, maybe. Okay. He is the um he is the Hamlet figure who doesn't trust that his his uh, wife is, is true. Is, yeah. she's not a good wife. Yeah. And he doesn't trust the motherhood aspect. Probably, you know, there there are a lot of things and we'll get to that, but um but in that case she's a bad wife again. And then it doesn't matter that she's – whether she's a good mother or not, she's gone. Yeah. And the children are gone too. Yeah. And that – and then everything falls apart. Mm. So – but in that case, there's a happy ending. Once once order is restored, Hermione comes back to life. She she yeah. literally – like it's, it's literally said that her statue comes to life. So there's a magical element there too that – but this is why the Winter's Tale and Cymbeline are yeah, problem plays. Yeah, they don't yeah. fit they don't nicely fit into easily, the, yeah. the other categories. So, yeah. um, But she would be the only other one that I can think of off the top of my head yeah. right now that fits that dichotomy of wife and mother yeah. and has to balance both. Well, another one that is, but it's not integral. It's not as integral to the to the play is Cleopatra. Because mm. um, Anthony and Cleopatra, she's, she's had kids, I think, with Caesar already. And some of the – she has kids with Anthony as well now. Um so she has this motherhood role, but it it it's not as fully explored as obviously with uh, Gertrude or, or Hermione. Um, but Cleopatra is another interesting woman in that she is a wife. Yeah. Um, but she's also the the queen. She is the ruler of Egypt. Well, it, and the Romans it, view her purely as a sex symbol. Exactly. Like she is symbol symbolic of all the things that have led to their rulers being pulled in. She's a seductress. Yes, she's yes, a siren. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, and. Talk about being punished. I mean, yeah. like she dies. <laughs> All her kids, I think, are killed as well. I don't remember. But if that's again, in the play or she not. doesn't die. She dies by her own hand. Yes, she does. She takes that into her own, under her own volition. Yeah. She clasps the asp to her breast exactly. and, and kills herself. And the other interesting thing is that there is, I don't remember where it is in the play, but at some point she basically has to choose between she could seek uh rome's she could go and support rome instead and leave yeah. anthony to his own devices yeah. and die but she chooses she feels genuine love for him mm-hmm. and she has the children with him uh and she chooses to yeah. side with him even though she knows she's probably going to lose the war because yeah. uh rome's just a juggernaut at this point and and egypt just can't sustain them so yeah. uh she's kind of stuck into this into this situation mm-hmm. um but she she makes that act of choice to side with the man she loves she chooses yeah love in uh to an extent kind of going back all the way to juliet and Mm -hmm. you know choosing this against the the power structures that are ganging up against her um and when she does die yeah she she does it by herself um so she i mean as a queen figure even more than lady Macbeth, i feel cleopatra is an active woman she she's very much um she doesn't rely on anything she's kind of the Beatrice of tragedies yeah. in the sense that she's always herself. Yeah. Uh, she has, I mean, she was granted with, you know, being coming into the monarchy and, and taking on the yeah, role. Of, she, she was born into, she was born into a the, high position. Exactly. So, I mean, she has that going for her, but she uses it well. Um, and she's, she's lived a long life basically of, of playing this political game and doing it very well mm-hmm. up until, uh, Anthony pisses off the the Romans and and loses the war and everything. So um, poor Ptolemies. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, they were all inbred too. So let's not get into that about her mother. Let's not talk about that. Uh, but yeah. So I mean, she's another really interesting one. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in our philosophy. Another category that uh, moving on to the later plays. Yeah. Um, uh, is the role of the daughter and mm-hmm. daughters in Shakespeare's plays. Um, daughters being kind of the first role that a woman would would assume Have, yep. and uh and so the contrast that we've decided to go with is is imogen from cymbeline one of those later problem plays the romances as they're often called and miranda from the tempest um both daughters both um somewhat defined but also they fit into the standard of femininity as well in yeah. a lot of respects and they both have more or less ha- – well, they don't die. Yeah. So let's – like, I mean, it's, it's, it's happy endings, right? That they don't, they don't end up dead because of their defiance of their fathers. So um, Imogen is the daughter of Cymbeline, who is the king of the Britons. Cymbeline is, is the only play that I know of that's set in Celtic Britain. Yeah. There is no other Shakespearean play that's – I don't think so. Oh, it's Titus Unless you can't. Well, no, I think those are all set in Rome. They're all actually so set in Rome. So if there's any yeah. kind of link to Britain, it's Roman Britain. It's, yeah, yeah. it's This is pre-Roman. Yeah. And, uh, or around the Roman yeah, period. So I think Imogen ends up 
stopping the war between the, the Romans, Romans and the Britons and, yeah, in the play. Okay. But um, she is the daughter of the king and he wants her to marry his stepson, I think, or half, mm-hmm. her half brother. No, I think it's stepson. Okay. And she refuses and marries Posthumus instead. Mm-hmm. And her father is is unbelievably angry at that and banishes Posthumus. And then um, Imogen is accused by the king's stepson of being um, slutty, basically. And yeah. he does this. He He's able to gain access to her bedchamber and finds a mole on her breast yeah. that he then relays to the king to say, to prove that he's been with, yeah. with Look how Im- slutty she Imogen. Is. I, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so Imogen is banished and she takes it upon herself to not only um, – reclaim her husband's place in Britain, but also her own virtue and, and her own innocence. Yeah. And she does this. She, she again, cross dresses a little bit and gets into with a family that, um, that kind of shelters her and, and takes care of her. And in the end, she is proven right. Yeah. And, and, and order is restored and yeah. everything comes happily. Posthumous can come back and everything is great. But, um, but that initial act of defiance leads to false accusations of, of infidelity and adultery and, and sluttishness. And that, um, instead of in the case of, Desdemona, for example, it doesn't lead to Imogen's death. It leads yeah. to her banishment, and there are problems. But she ends up, you know, Being able to solve them herself. Yeah, which is important, yeah. right? And taking that, and, and she has help. I mean, yeah. the the brothers that she, the well, they find out their brothers over the course of the play, but um, they they help her, and she does. She's not alone. Yeah, but the impetus is all hers. Yes, she is um, the motivating factor behind the. The resolution of those problems, yeah. Exactly. And I mean, she's, she's, even though she's defiant and kind of, um, she's not obedient. She doesn't yeah. follow that, yeah. that chase silent obedient thing. She is innocent and she's very beautiful. Like she's, she's very typically, um, a, a beautiful heroine character in Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. And everybody agrees that she's beautiful too. But she's, um, she's still, so she's like she's able to retain those maybe outward feminine looks until she cross dresses at which point she's yes like but don't some of the characters still remark on her beauty or something like yeah that? like <laughs> it's just it's it's undeniable so she's still very very feminine but she's able to stand up for herself yeah. so that's something that is denied some of the earlier characters like mm. Ophelia who is noted yeah. for her beauty and um so so that's important i think to note same with miranda who is um this is less of less of a compare contrast and more just this is yeah not a contrast a comparison i guess um miranda being prospero's daughter she's the only female character out of four female characters who are mentioned even she's the only one to appear on stage and she kind of is this stand-in for chastity or virtue which a lot of people take as a kind of a sexist view and say that she doesn't exist as anything more than that but but she's an important feminizing figure um she's she's the foil for prospero right like she's what allows him to embrace qualities that are not typical to powerful male characters like compassion and 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 that shows how there's there's two sides to great leadership, I think, and and without Miranda, the Tempest would be a very different play. Yeah, Prospero would be a very different character because he he exists for Miranda. He does a lot of what he yes. does for his daughter. Yeah, um, and they've been banished to this island, and it's it's hardship upon hardship for them. But but she is still this civilizing force. Yeah, because without her, he would just be a madman. Mm-hmm. So it's because of the woman in his life, his daughter, yeah. that he is able to retain his humanity and and if, affect um, positive change by the end of the play. Yeah, no, that's a really great point. And, and Miranda is interesting for me, uh, partly because um, she also engage like I, I can't remember the play well enough, unfortunately, right now. But, you know, she basically engages uh, her love interest herself. Yeah. Um, it's not something her, her well, father... Well, and her after father refusing kinda, him, because her father yeah. wants her to marry Prince yeah. Ferdinand. Yeah. But she refuses, and then she's like, well, Maybe. he's not that bad, exactly. and then goes after him, right? Exactly. So. And and giving him, giving her... I mean, she's really, yeah, like you said, she's really the, the crux of the whole 
play. Um, and yet she's not just a plot device. She, she, she is a character who mm. kind of feels fully fleshed out and you get to go on that journey with her of falling in love with her, her suitor and, yeah. uh, helping her father, you know, come to forgiveness and, yeah. uh, um, yeah. So, I mean, she, she's really great that way too. And I think it is, um, I think both characters are kind of interesting in that this is near the end of Shakespeare's right. career. Um, and the women he's these daughters that he's writing about um have agency yeah and they have um they are capable of happiness within right. the structures that we've been talking about all episode right um and i think that's a big change um and i i i, I again we were talking about tina parker's book at the or packer sorry tina packer's book at the start and i've mentioned a couple times um i generally didn't uh, care for the whole matching shakespeare's right. life to the women characters but this one does feel uh prescient in us in a way because uh he had a daughter two two daughters fact, they were both around you know in their 20s at this point yeah. in his career so you know, they, they were they were in that age where they were uh, probably for sure married i think yeah. uh probably having some kids of their own and you know shakespeare was looking towards retirement you know he's he's getting older um again this is i don't usually do this but i i can totally see this where you know he's looking at these fully grown women realizing wow i've seen them grow up from little children to these people now yeah and they are they're full people yeah the, you know it kind of yeah. puts to rest you know like well are women just property he's right. coming out and saying hard no because this is he's seen it himself i think and it it is clear in these characters that he wants them to not only have the agency but to have the agency to achieve happiness yeah and and the fact that they're both daughters um who disobey their parents their fathers specifically yeah um is because they is, know better <laughs> yeah and and that's exactly it they know yeah. better than their fathers and i think that's something that um you know juliet doesn't get that no. in 1593 or whenever no. whenever romeo and juliet was written she knows She's... better than her father she knows that this will end the feud between the capulets yeah. and the montagues and and lord capulet doesn't doesn't want um, to end it yeah you know well it's, maybe he maybe he wants to end it but he doesn't think that there's any um his it doesn't it wouldn't have even occurred to him that yeah. his 13 year old daughter would have the answer yeah. whereas um and i don't remember how old miranda is yeah i don't think it'd be expensive. i don't know how old imogen is yeah but um but they're not they're not treated like children yes and i think that's the important thing is that their fathers are displeased with their disobedience mm -hmm. but in the end the fathers realize that their daughters were right yeah. and and even if they don't come out explicitly and state that they know their daughters were right yeah. the end of the play resolves the question for us yeah. and that's what's that's what's fascinating about these later problem yes. plays and the daughters and and you're right i mean it's hard to not read into it and, and everybody always reads into Te the tempest as yeah, shakespeare's, shakespeare's swan, swan song, song yeah. and and prospero's final speech being the writer laying down his pen just as prospero lays down his wand like yeah. it's or his staff so yeah. it's 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 hard not to do that, even though we don't like to do that. We're doing it here. And that, I mean, send us an email if you disagree. But, yeah. but I mean, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think the biggest contrast to mention for that whole thing is obviously King Lear and his oh, yes. daughters. Because uh, their relationship is less good. <laughs> At least Regan and Goneril's are. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, I mean, that's a case study in daughters. Uh, between the two evil ones and Cordelia, the virtuous and true uh, yeah. one. And I think it's it's interesting in that um, Lear is uh, obsessed with um, control, even to his, mm -hmm. his final, you know, even he's as he's giving up away control, control, but he wants to control, but he wants to it, control all. it all. Still. Yeah. And it's... Um, and it's the silliness and the the hypocrisy of that that leads to all of his problems in the yeah. first place. Um, but then these these women characters are, you know, in a way punished. And I mean that in the sense of the play punishes them morally by saying they're bad characters yeah. for doing what he told them to do, essentially. Right. Like he gave them a third of his land each 
or well, more because he didn't give anything to Cordelia. Yeah. And then he's upset when they're doing things with it that he doesn't like. Like yeah. it's Lear is kind of a, a stupid character that yeah. It's well, he's hard a to, doddering old man. He's, he's doddering old man. He yeah. doesn't really understand what's happening. Um, and then when he gets taken advantage of, I mean, it's it sounds like we're excusing elder abuse, which is not, <laughs> not no, no. cool either. But <laughs> but you know, like it's it's kind of like he he wanted. He was not willing to actually let go. Yeah. Um, and so the fact that Regan and Goneril are kind of held up as like the emblems of terrible daughters who are untrue and don't care about their father is, uh, you know, understandable. Mm-hmm. But it feels like he um, was asking, kind of asking for, for it. it. Jeez, I walked <laughs> right into that. That's terrible. But yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting way to say that the these are ter- they're the epitome of terrible daughters. And then you have Cordelia, who's perfect. Um, well, Lear was the architect of his own destruction. Exactly. And and his daughters being the product of, of his loins, for lack of a better <laughs> – I mean, they they took advantage of him. And that is, that is absolutely true. But it was his own um, ineptitude and, and his own – his own I think, lack of awareness that they would do that. Well, you know? and 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 I think it's it's a condemnation of of unchecked power when yeah. you're when you're someone who has been surrounded by yes men your whole life. Yes. You can't imagine that someone would do something bad to you. Yeah. You you would be shielded from that. And yeah. and when it's your own daughters who are doing that to you, it's even more unfathomable. So of course Lear is going to be content to play this little game. Who loves me the most? You know, and, and of course, Regan and Goneril are going to play right into it. And of yeah. course, Cordelia is going to be object honest. and yeah. be honest. Yeah. And, yeah. and of course, that's this, this is going to be the end result. It's just, it's it's classic dramatic irony that yeah. the audience knows from the very beginning, this fantastic opening of King Lear, which is just so powerful, unlike anything else in, in most of Shakespeare, yeah. most of literature Where basically everything is set out in the first <laughs> right scene it's this then, fantastic yeah. conflict that's yeah. set up right from the beginning and you know exactly how it's going to end yeah. and of course lear does get his redemption when he, he reconciles yeah. with cordelia yeah, the but yeah. then he and both he and cordelia die yeah. so it's not it's not actually a happy ending at yeah. all yeah but there's some sort of redemption and the redemption comes through forgiveness from his daughter and that yeah. is something that is not you know hamlet doesn't get forgiveness from his mother or no. ophelia uh othello doesn't get forgiveness from desdemona, desdemona. No. Uh, macbeth doesn't get forgiveness from anyone i mean the the women who are wronged rarely get that power at the end to bestow forgiveness and this is what cordelia is given yeah. in a way um not that she ever asked for it she's she's this like essentially unproblematic character throughout yeah. the entire play. She's yeah. the most unproblematic um, and she gets the short shrift, but, but she does have this incredible power to bestow forgiveness and, um, and love and grace on her father before they both die. Yeah. Which is not something that. No, that the rest of the plays other... really don't have that, especially as a daughter role. Um, yeah. And I think that's. And it's, it's important. This, yeah. this is so Lear is 1605, 1606, something like that. And, and it leads into these later problem plays where the daughters are far more complex yeah. and um, and get that happy ending. So it's it's kind of a nice progression when you look at, you know, a daughter like Juliet and then a daughter like Cordelia and then a daughter like Imogen yeah. or Miranda who who are, you know, it's a nice arc for, yeah. for daughters. Yeah. I mean, really the whole trio of daughters in, in Lear, it's almost like they get kind of combined into the, the in, these are, these are more fully formed women. Cause the, the other ones, I mean, like you said, Cordelia is so unproblematic. She's yeah. basically not even really a character. She's just like right. a force of good. Yeah. When she's on stage, good things are going to happen. Right. And when Regan and Goneril on stage, bad things are going to happen. Like, right. That's, they're stereotypes. They're, they're stock characters. Yeah. They're very stock characters. Yeah. Right. And the future ones are, are much more dynamic than that. Yeah. yeah. Even if they're not truly evil, like Regan and Goneril are, yeah. they have, they have, their own interests of heart. I think that exactly. the positive characteristics of Regan and Goneril yeah. are that they know what they want and they don't have any problem going and getting them. Whereas the positive characteristics of Cordelia are her goodness and grace. So those are what get combined yeah. into Imogen and yeah, Miranda. Exactly. Double, double toil and trouble. Fire burn and cold and bubble. I guess the last category is the the magical women. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting. I mean, we talked in the, in our intro episode about the the superstitious 
and magical beliefs of, of Elizabethan society. Um, so when you have characters like witches or fairies, it's, it's kind of, um, I think all of the rules go out the window, the rules of femininity, the rules of womanhood go out the window. You have, you know, the three witches in Macbeth who are not given names. They're just yeah. which one, two, and yeah. three. <laughs> um, they speak in unison yeah. or when they don't, they're speaking prophecy. It's not, um, there's nothing really in, that individuates them. Yeah, there's no character there. Again, mm-hmm. they're kind of a force of nature. Same with uh, Titania to yeah. a certain extent. I mean, a little bit more. She's she has motivations and stuff. Yeah, it's not just a and mystical. she and Oberon have like their their the whole argument is what sets the play in yeah. motion. I mean, yeah. if it if it wasn't for them arguing over over things, Bottom would never have been turned into an ass, and yeah. we wouldn't have had you know all these. Mixed, yeah, up mixed up love, up, yeah, love triangle, triangles, quadrangles, quadrangles yeah. <laughs> in the woods that yeah, night for these yeah. Greek youngsters. So, um, but but it is it the way they're presented usually is as forces of nature. They yeah. are they are very much just uh, you know they're things beyond uh, human desires. They they have you know I mean Titania is dumbed down into you know a human problem right. for the sake of the audience, but the way she's always shown is you know as a, a fairy figure or something like yeah. that. Um, a similar one is Ariel. Uh, who may may not be a woman? Yeah, Ariel is an interesting one. That's the the um, the sprite, sprite figure from the Tempest. Who yeah. is? I I was I can't remember where I read this, but it seems to me that um, most, if not well, the the majority of the time that char- that this character was portrayed, it was portrayed by a woman. Mm. Um, but there is no it, it's, there, it's the gender the is all, not. Yeah revealed at any point in the play um and maybe like for me ariel was the little mermaid that's what yeah, i'm going obviously. for so so and I, I just imagine <laughs> that the name ariel came down through the ages as a female <laughs> name so maybe i'm projecting backwards but i do remember reading that somewhere that that most of the portrayals of ariel were done by women after the point where women were able to yeah. to be on stage so um so i'm counting her as i'm counting ariel as a as a female Magic magical character, character but yeah. It could go either way. And I think that in itself is interesting that this magical character doesn't really have a specified gender, not to suggest that Shakespeare was so woke <laughs> that he was creating non-binary no. characters in the in well, the but 1610s. perhaps the sprites did have, you know, in the folklore of the time, perhaps that was something that, yeah. oh, well, they're not, not they're neither boy nor girl, you right. know, or something like that. It could have been something that he was picking up and playing with. Sure. But, um, yeah, it is interesting that even to this day, it's, it's not specified and it is open to... Uh, different interpretations. Um, Sycorax is another one from The Tempest, yeah, Tempest who is yeah. um, Caliban's mother, not portrayed, just mentioned on stage. Mentioned but on stage. but you can't imagine that a character like Caliban is going to spring forth from the womb yeah, of a good the, character. Yeah. So it's a magical character who has evil intent. Yeah. Or, and, or and at least... Prospero is possibly uh, Caliban's father. So yeah. there's there's a whole mix, messy situation mm-hmm. there about where did Sycorax come from on this deserted island? Was she magical? Was she a sprite similar to ariel who prospero yeah. impregnated like is it it's very very confusing as to what any of this means and and th- so these these fairy characters which characters are um they're not characters that the humans should trust i think that's what's important the mm-hmm. fact that i can't think aside from prospero who is a magician a male magician yeah there aren't any male figures who have magical abilities. Oh, and Oberon, I guess. Yeah, Titania's sure, yeah. Yeah, husband. Course, yeah. Um, but there aren't very many characters who are who are who are male and magical. They're I mean, female and magical. Uh, yeah, Midsummer yeah, Night's Dream is a Mids- one-off. Yeah, okay. Kind of so like, yeah. I'm wrong, but I mean, this is this is um, there. There's something I don't know what, but that these these magical characters are female mm-hmm. for the most part for the most part yeah. is i don't know i i kind of i kind of want to say it's like attributing female qualities to the thing that you don't understand, understand. exactly is kind of <laughs> funny to me it's like saying yes like i don't know why i'm in love with you so it must be some kind the of feminine, feminine 
yeah magic that's, that's making you yeah. um making you know there's something dropped into my eyes and that's what's making me <laughs> fall in love with you and it was a woman who did it to me yeah. or a female sprite S- yeah figure yeah or was a female witch on the moor who you well, know like and, and the idea of witches i think is important in the time period too because they were burning witches right I mean, yeah this was literally a thing that was very prevalent in the culture of the time is if you don't understand it she's a witch burn yeah. it's you know it's the money python I, I, sketch all over again king james famously wrote a book that yeah. explained how to tell who were witches and and who weren't. Yes. So and, I mean, this you're absolutely right. Yeah. So so and they were most of the time they were women. So it was just it was just a way to to dismiss the thing you didn't understand or yeah. to dismiss the problematic women of the time. Exactly. To and say that they were witches. Exactly, and that's what makes uh, again the uh, Imogen and and Miranda characters interesting mm-hmm. is that they're. Um, well, especially Miranda, I would say, is because she's the daughter of a magician. Right. Um, you know, the 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 threat was always there that she should be burned as a witch. I mean, right. she was literally, you know, a, the, a, the, like, the yeah, daughter the, of a of a wizard, I guess. Yeah. So you know, that makes her a witch, kind of thing. But it's it's treated differently in 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 that end. Uh, whereas a lot of the other, I mean, like the witches in Macbeth are just prophecies and and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think. The Tempest is a really interesting play for that because mm-hmm. it does use magic. And, and it's explicit so many... about magic. Exactly. And it's magic that's happening. Um, like human characters. Yeah. It's not It's not some, some weird witchy people who appear out of the mist and they're not sprites living in a forest. Yeah. They're actual people who have magical abilities. Yeah. Yeah, which is and just a different. It's a change, and it yeah. it is. But they're treated as humans, mm-hmm. which is interesting because the the witches and the other ones are very much similar to your explanation of they're the things that you don't understand. Yeah. And actually, one of the best ones of that is Cassandra, right? Uh, from Troyes and Cresta, yeah. as you know, the soothsayer, you know, the the Cassandra. <laughs> she, you know, yeah, she's she's a stock she's, character now yeah, in, exactly. in in our culture because she's so famous for being right, a seer, but, yeah, and yeah, being predicting everything, and then no one listens to her, yeah. <laughs> Which is again a commentary, but nobody. Uh, it doesn't. Troyes and Cressa is not aware. Uh, it's not poking fun at the fact that everybody should be listening to Cassandra. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh, this crazy bitch. Like, yeah. it, it, it writes her off again, yeah. uh, as they did in Troy, yes. and as they <laughs> have down through the ages, right? And so she's another example of of this character who, uh, of this woman who's just ignored because nobody understands her. Which is contrasted with the Oracle of Delphi in The Winter's mm, Tale. Yeah, who comes in and exonerates Hermione at the end. There you go. But, um, but that's not something that... Like it's it's only like it's it's it is interesting that that you have certain certain types of magic or or are and and Cassandra may not be magic they that might be something else yeah but, but it's but unexplainable it's, it's yeah yeah dismissed it's like Mercutio and the Queen Mab thing in mm-hmm. in um in Romeo and Juliet Julia. where it's like your dreams are the are well first of all dreams which. Cassandra might be brushed off because these are nothing more than dreams, yeah. right? But dreams are the product of an idle mind or the children of an idle mind is, is the quote. Um, and Queen Mab just delivers them to you. Yeah. They're just something that – and Queen Mab herself is a m- magical character, I suppose, that yeah. you could look at. But um, but these are things to be dismissed. These are things to be um, to be brushed off yeah. because they're not in the here and now, which which makes Prospero and Miranda that much more notable. And then, of course, there's like Hermione herself, who maybe magically becomes human from her statue. Yeah, a little, a little Pygmalion <laughs> uh, thing going yeah, on there. Yeah. But, um, but I, you know, just, just to, in the interest of thoroughness, you know, yeah. we mentioned her earlier. She might fit into a magical character. She might not. But, um, but that's, yeah, interesting in and of herself. Yeah. Once more into the breach, dear friend! Once more! Or close the wall up with our English dead! So our question this week, or this episode, I should say. Does Shakespeare treat women in his plays as thoughtful, deep characters like he does with many of his male characters? Uh, I will be taking the affirmative case. And Lindsay will be arguing against this very clear fact. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'll start us off. Um... 
uh, I have to say that, yes, um, of course he does, because we just spent an hour talking about how detailed <laughs> these women are. But, I mean, you said it yourself in the intro. These women are, are, are really unforgettable in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, they There's so many of them. They have so many different facets to them, to their characters and to their um, to their voices within the play that uh, I don't think you can write that much about the women even if they are only 10 percent or 15 percent or whatever it was you you mentioned at the start uh the characters that are there are just quite dynamic at the end of the day especially someone like i love portia i'll always come back to portia Mm -hmm. because she's she's fit in the role and then she'll come out and go against it and she can be a man and she can be the best man uh and then she can go back to being a woman right away and i don't think you can write a character like that without believing that it's possible uh and that women are actually capable of this. Um, I mean, perhaps perhaps he was just giving the audience what he wanted, what they wanted. I, I could grant that, but um, I, I think, uh, especially as we went through the timeline, even now as we were talking, uh, you can really see that um, he was willing to give women uh, not necessarily the same voice as the men or the same roles as the men, but he's willing to imagine them in those same roles and having a similar uh powerful voice and it's kind of a shame that i I don't know the 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 romances as well as you do like cymbeline and winter's tale but it sounds like those are really interesting women too uh because i don't think i've ever read those ones but um even even in the uh because i think those are really interesting women uh but even in the ones that we did talk about and that i do know really well um i think there's a certain level of rationality to the women in in the place even the ones who get really raw deals like ophelia or desdemona um they were fulfilling the roles that were expected of them and i think that's a really interesting uh expression of what women were capable of they were doing as well as they could and they were doing it in a rational way to fill their roles and they were taught that society would protect them and help them uh and they would be rewarded for being good people in this way um, the fact that they all got killed and so on is is shitty, but uh, that happens to every that happens today even. So uh, I think those women are still fully functioning characters. I think, uh, and I think they're quite good. Lindsay, what do you what do you have to say? Well, I don't disagree wholly with everything that you said. Yes, I win, but <laughs> I think that that it's. I mean, just the fact that that. In going through our podcast and and structuring this episode, we we were able to fit these women into such clearly defined categories means that they were still they were maybe good examples of stereotypes, but they were stereotypes nonetheless. We still had maids, we still had uh, wives, we still had mothers, and and these women could only act for the most part, could only act so much within the roles that they had been assigned or that they'd fallen into. So um, even even characters like Lady Macbeth, who um, does have that agency to dictate her own future, she's still quite badly condemned for doing so. And so it doesn't, it doesn't mean that she's not deep and thoughtful, but I mean... The women, the women in Shakespeare's plays don't get to express their thoughts and emotions the way that the men do. So I think that that even if even if we can read into their actions and say that that represents depth and emotion and um, thoughtfulness, they don't get the chance to speak for themselves the way that Hamlet does or the way that uh, Lear does. They they kind of we kind of have to read into it through the things that they do, and there's no real proof mm. present in mm. in the plays. Like for example, Hamlet. Hamlet gets this big, beautiful "to be or not to be" speech where he <laughs> questions his own existence and the existence of of man and and sorrow and all of these things that come up from it from a depth of. Th- this deep wellspring of grief that he's been pitched into because of his father's murder. Um, we just get Ophelia bouncing around talking about flowers and then drowning herself in the river. We don't get her expressing the depth of her sorrow. Yeah. We can infer that she's had a depth of sorrow and people talk about it afterwards that, oh, she was so distraught, but she never gets to say it herself. And I think that that is important. I don't... I don't know that Shakespeare was 
shying away from it because he didn't know how to write women's speech. I, I don't doubt that he could have done justice to a female character. And there are examples of it. Tamora gets to speak um, powerful things. Juliet. Juliet does too. Cleopatra. But, but yes, but I think, I'll, <laughs> but I think you get it. It's not, they're not things that, that complicate the character the way that the male speeches yeah get to do to the male characters sure. and and for the most part these women are um they're still acted upon and they're still um people talking around them i mean you brought up julia who famously doesn't get a, a single word in at the end of the play yeah. the two gentlemen of verona yeah. <laughs> even though she's a strong character she's, she's still silent yeah. and i think that is the most important thing that comes out of this is that you can't be deep and thoughtful if we don't hear your voice and for a lot of these female characters we don't get to hear their voice as much or we don't get a sense of who they are from the things that they say it's more the things that we see them do and then it's open to interpretation and that's why we have that's why you're able to read into this feminism or yeah. um whatever because shakespeare certainly didn't seek out to you know, votes for women was not on his mind, but you could read into these characters and you can set them in a time that 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 makes that possible because of the way that they act, not necessarily because of the way that they speak. And I think that's an important distinction. There are things that will disprove what I'm saying, but I think for the most part, when you yeah, think of the deep, of yeah. the deep, um, thoughtful soliloquies and the speech and the the depth of emotion, they all almost all belong to men. And and. As you were saying that, I, I was realizing that there are no there are no female protagonists that really drive the plot in uh, really any of Shakespeare's plays. I mean, there's none. No. There's. I'm trying to think of any of the ones we've talked about. I mean, Beatrice a little bit to an extent because Lady she does Macbeth help. a little bit. If Lady you look Macbeth. at her as a protagonist, which it's hard to do. But exactly. There's 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 no, you know, the tragical history of a princess. Like there, yeah. there's nothing like that. There's no. it's always Romeo and Juliet, Anthony and Cleopatra. And even when you do have a, a strong female character from history, like Joan of Arc, yeah, she she's her character changes a lot throughout Henry the Fourth as well. Like she's not yeah. really set as Consistent, a, yeah, which is problematic. And we'll get to that when we talk about the play. But yeah, but yeah, I mean, there's there's really nothing. There's no there's no example of a woman being the central character in a play. No, in the way there is in any of the uh, any of the place the the man the men are always cent central i mean i think miranda's getting coming around to it in a mm -hmm. sense because again like we mentioned she was the central driving force of mm -hmm. a lot of what was happening prospero is the main character there's no dancing around that uh you know and i think that's that is kind of a little disheartening you just you just broke my heart Lindsay. well and but i mean it's not to say that shakespeare was not capable of doing this or that there aren't the seeds are there i think that, yeah, that there, shakespeare there leads of... to afro ben and afro ben leads to, to charlotte bronte and jane austen who yeah. absolutely write women who change the, the their own fate holy yeah. the stories are from their point of view and you don't get that progression if you don't have a character like um viola or yeah. portia or miranda so i mean it's not like this is a, a lost cause but i just i just don't see the depth of character there that i do for the men yeah okay i'll give you that did i win this round no you lose yeah you won <laughs> yes why then the world's mine oyster which i with sword will open so that's our episode i guess we're uh we're at the end of of our conversation this was a bit of a a long haul I, if you're yeah. sticking with us to the end thanks very much for listening yeah. um so our next play that we're going to be discussing is the taming of the, the shrew, taming of the shrew um which we'll get into a lot of the issues that we kind of discussed here but a little bit more in depth relating just to that play and not necessarily to the rest of the plays around it um yeah anything else to say anything no, to add I've, to that Aiden? i've uh, this has been a good discussion thank you very much Lindsay. oh thank you very much as a much. woman i feel like i should give you the last <laughs> I don't have any last words. <laughs> I really bungled this, didn't I? I didn't come up with a good sign-off. Ah. <sighs>You can find all our episodes on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast fix. 
If you want to tell us what you think of Shakespeare, his plays, poems, or any of the topics we discuss, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us on Twitter, that's at the Bixpod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Bixpod, or by email at thebixpod at gmail.com. That's our cue to exit.